just form a fucking wall. O'Neal deep in the post, lots of contact there. Oh, what a block by Wallace What wow. a jump ball. Pistons down four, 12-8, 7-38 to play the first one. Oh, first from Rodney, stuck into the rim. Count them, baby, and a foul. Reggie inside for Andre, oh. and a dynamite dunk. Welcome back, Pistons fans, to another edition of the Palace of Pistons podcast. We have quite a bit of news to get to today. A lot has happened on the Pistons front. Some people are going to be eating their words, like both Aaron and I, when it comes to Jeremy Grant. We have to talk about Killian Hayes. And then the topic of Pistons Twitter is Seku Dumboya. Um, With me, as always, uh, I wouldn't want anybody else, uh, is Aaron Johnson. Aaron, how are you doing, man? Well, you know, Mike, you and I were talking about it before uh, we started recording, but it is the month of January. It's cold outside. It's dark out early. It's definitely the most depressing month of the year. It doesn't help that the Pistons are 2-8 and eight and are not playing their young guys, whether it be because of injury or by coach's decision. Um, you know, not the best month, but always excited to be here with you talking about the Pistons. Um, there's a lot to get into today. Unfortunately, some of the stuff we're getting into kind of falls in line with that January kind of being a sucky month uh, because there's some sucky topics that we have to discuss, but they're important topics uh, regarding the future and what's best for the Detroit Pistons franchise. So as always, I'm excited and ready to get into it with you. And let's get into it. And yes, it is the most depressing month out of the whole year, but you know, ideally the months after this really depressing month gradually starts to get better and hopefully uh, the Pistons sort of follows. So we start to get some good news here uh, to balance out all of the all of the bad that comes with January. And the first topic that we have to get to uh, is Killian Hayes. On the fourth of January, uh, he suffered a right hip injury against the Bucks. They sort of called it a hip strain. They 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 were very ambiguous with what it was, and then they later ruled that it was a labral tear in his right hip. And then there was another bit of ambiguity. Typically people with that injury, they don't come back for the rest of the season, regardless of when it actually happens. It's a pretty serious injury. Then there was a report that said he could come back after four to six weeks of rehab. Um, what, what are we, what are we to make of, of all this with Killian Hayes? We, we talked about him in last week's pod um, just about how important he is. Uh, and how everybody needs to not panic. What do we make of this injury now uh, on top of the struggles that Hayes was having? Yeah, it's, it's an important situation for doom or excuse me, for Killian Hayes. And it's not one that you definitely want to be in if you're the Pistons or Hayes. Um, this kind of an injury is not one you want to suffer. Not that you ever want to suffer an injury, but the, uh, tra- trajectory that this injury sets you on is not a good one. You look at past players that have gone through the injury that Killian Hayes has and what that has, you know, caused for them or what kind of recovery they've had to go through. You know, it's something that has happened to a lot of different players in this league. Probably some of the bigger names are guys like LaMarcus Aldridge or Wilson Chandler that have had uh, a, a labrum tear, a labrum injury of this magnitude. And some of these players that suffer these injuries don't always come back the same and they don't always play at the best level. Um, LaMarcus Aldridge is one of those cases where he has been a very good player and he suffered a hip injury in college and then suffered uh, this similar injury back in 2012 when he was playing for the Portland Trailblazers. Um, So he's obviously had a very long and successful career through the injuries he has had, but guys like Wilson Chandler, Gerald Henderson, they've never been able to, you know, get to the peak of their performance uh, in terms of overall style of play. There's a lot of different guys that you can go down this road with and and examine, Um, but you're looking at either a four to six weeks injury timeline. If he doesn't go for surgery, if he goes for surgery, he's going to probably be out closer to six months rather than four to six weeks. 
it's a season ending injury, just, you know, less than 10 games into his rookie season. Um, it's, it's something that Detroit really needs to take the time in figuring out, which is why I'm okay with the fact that we haven't really heard anything yet. This is something that they really need to wait and see on. They need to see how Hayes, uh, you know, is feeling. If there's any sort of uh, update progress, uh, you know, changes in his, what's going on with his hip over the first week or so since the injury. Um, and it needs to be examined and examined until they can really figure out uh, what the best method is to getting Killian Hayes in the, in the best situation for him. And I, I think, unfortunately, the best thing for him is likely to get the surgery. Um, I remember reading back when we first heard about this injury that guys have tried to come back from this injury and, you know, it's, it's, this was without surgery and it's come back, you know, quickly, the same style of injury, hip issues, things like that. And that's not something that you want festering throughout uh, your, your career and, and becoming a long-term issue. So it may be best for him to get the surgery, which certainly sucks because that means, uh, that he would miss the rest of his rookie season. Um, but it might be the best long-term decision for him. And I don't know if that's the case, but when you look at what other players have gone through, when you look at the injuries that they've had, and uh, if it's reoccurred, if they don't opt for the surgery, it's something that it, it's an incredibly important decision and, and they really need to take their time in deciding what is best for Hayes here. I'm not the one that can tell you that, uh, the right decision. You aren't like no one outside of professional doctors and medical examiners can, can really come up with the right decision uh, in terms of what Hayes should do. It's not a situation that, uh, you know, you would wish upon a rookie or any player in the NBA. It is certainly a very unfortunate situation, but now it's uh, you have to make the most of the situation and make sure you handle it in the most professional way. I, I think Isaiah Thomas had this injury. Not Pistons great Isaiah Thomas, obviously, but Boston Celtics fan favorite Isaiah Thomas. And when he was traded to Cleveland, that was something that um, was a bit of a holdup. Obviously not enough of a holdup for the Cavs to desperately trade Kyrie Irving to Boston to get something back. But you know, Isaiah Thomas, that lingered for a while. And I can't remember which path he chose. I don't know how serious it was. But he's obviously never been the same, and now he's obviously not on an NBA team. You know, but he's at a different age. There's different heights and weights and ability to recover and things like that that certainly play into it. It's I was going to read this list of people who have had the similar injury, and it's really not fun uh, to add on to the depressing January like uh, NBA great Johnny Flynn, Gerald Henderson had it twice. Wilson Chandler had it twice. Aldridge had it. Martel Webster, Kevon Looney, Jordan Hill. I mean, there's a not an, not exactly a uh, lovely list of players who have gone through this type of injury. Um, obviously, I think we're on the same page where we we don't want him to come back in six weeks if there's a possibility that it could be worse. Like if he can, if doctors say, yeah, he could probably come back in six weeks. To me. That's a, that's a red flag of, oh, okay, thanks for the information. He's not going to go back in six weeks. We have nothing to play for. We have nothing to really gain right now by throwing out our seventh overall pick into the fire and seeing what happens. Is that, is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and one other thing that needs to be talked about uh, here with Hayes and with injuries in general is, is that medicine and, and – and, uh, scientific, you know, scientific ways to deal with injuries has grown and it continues to grow literally by the day. Uh, you know, it, there are injuries that five years ago were considered career ending, such as a, a torn ACL, uh, a, a meniscus tear that are now just kind of not that, not that they're not a big deal. They're certainly big injuries, but it's, much more expected that a player is going to be able to come back and actually is able to perform at a high level uh, following that kind of injury. So 
I, I, I don't want it to sound like the picture we're painting here for Hayes is no matter what, he's not, you know, th- he's going to be hampered by this and this is going to, uh, you know, kill his career, whether he gets the surgery or not. Modern medicine, it, it advances each and every single day, uh, which is when you try to paint a better picture, look at the bright side, something that should certainly be kept into account here. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And, and everybody recovers differently. I, I mean, and you're right. Modern medicine has taken so many leaps forward, torn ACLs. I mean, every, it seems like every athlete tears their ACL. Tommy John surgery in baseball. Some pitchers get preemptive Tommy John surgery because they know they're going to have to get it. So they just get it. I mean, there are, there are some freaks like Masahiro Tanaka that just kind of avoid it and use platelet injections and, and whatnot, which is an option here for Hayes as well, but there's risk to surrounding muscles. I think, I think I read there's risk to extended groin injuries because of the relation of this muscle to the groin muscle. So yeah, the Pistons don't have any reason to, um, <laughs> uh, you know, throw, throw them out there for the sake of getting him some on-court action. Um, it, it just doesn't make any sense. So let's say that doctors say he, that he could return in four to six weeks. Do you want Killian Hayes to come back in four to six weeks? Do you feel comfortable with him coming back in four to six weeks? If, if doctors say, yeah, he could probably come back. Not really, no. Um, I look back, and, and not that I want to paint the, a, a bad picture on the organization or anything, but you look back to when Blake Griffin was dealing with his uh, leg injuries, and around the playoffs, you know, he suffered that injury, and the Pistons doctors were saying he can't hurt it any more than it already is if he plays. And, and look at Blake Griffin now. You know, this season he's been a, a shell of him former self, and is really, really not the player that he was just a couple seasons ago before he went through those injury issues. Uh, I don't want to say I don't trust the medical staff, because I do, but I don't think there is a need to put Killian Hayes back on the court unless you are 100% certain that he is healthy and he is not at risk. Uh, It would need to be a very concrete, Look, after six weeks of rehab, Killian is going to be healthy. His hip will be at 100% strength, uh, you know, all of that stuff to the point where we are confident, 100% confident that he can go back out there and he is not putting himself at risk in any sense of the fashion in terms of re-injuring his hip because of the injury that he previously suffered. Obviously, you can get hurt and you can hurt different, you know, you can hit your leg, whatever, you can hurt your ankle, whatever, but this injury, this hip injury is not going to affect him and put him at risk to re-injure it or injure something else in the process. Uh, that is the only way that I would be comfortable because it, it, it it's a very risky game to play, and we've seen the uh, – effects of this injury you look at a a player like Kevon Looney who was playing uh, and developing for the Warriors and at the time you know there was a lot of talk that this guy might be their big of the future and then he got hurt and he has not been the same player since Uh, so it the Pistons need to take all caution with Hayes in this situation yes agreed the risk uh, you know greatly outweighs the reward Okay, he has a couple of really nice games, makes some nice passes. Guess what? He's still really young. He's going to have time to do that. This is a truncated season. Uh, you know, getting a surgery like that, there's there's uh, there's risks in hospitals and things too with COVID, and you know, he might become at risk by by having to go through a surgery like this. There's there's just too many things that that weigh against him coming back, even if it's for that four to six weeks. Let guys like Sadiq Bey cook, and he is cooking. And Isaiah Stewart, uh, and and see what you have from, from the other pieces there. Those were the pieces that were less uh, for sure. Um, Hayes was sort of more of a known product, it feels like, from a lot of scouts. See what these other guys can do. Let Hayes r- recover. 
And when the NBA starts up again next season, however that may be, um, expect him to be back and be healthy. If, if that is the, the right way to go, then that is what the Pistons should do. You don't want to lose your rookie season. You don't want to miss a year of on-the-court action. But you have to take all precautions uh, in a situation like this. That it, It's the bottom line. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, in wrapping up our Killian Hayes talk, I wanted to uh, move on to one of our sponsors here today before we get on to our topic of where Aaron and I continue to eat crow for Jeremy Grant being way better than what we expected. Um, I wanted to tell everybody about um, our partner Thrive Fantasy. Thrive is a daily uh, fantasy sports app for player props from NBA to NFL and even PGA. Thrive Fantasy has you covered with a wide variety of player prop bets for everyone. Use promo code PALACE, that's P-A-L-A-C-E, when you sign up today, and you will receive an instant deposit match up to 50 bucks on your first deposit of 20 or more. Download Thrive Fantasy on the App Store or the Google Play Store or by visiting their website, www.thrivefantasy.com. Sign up and prop up today. And again, that promo code is PALACE, P A L A. C E and you will receive an instant deposit match up to 50 bucks on your first deposit of 20 or more. I'm loving it. Okay. I, let's move on to topic number two. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Aaron. Yeah. I'm just want to say I'm loving it. I, I, I won again the other day. I don't, you know, I've not done any of the big money gambles yet, but uh, you know, I've enjoyed the player props. I like the the style that they, they give you, you know, you, you get to pick uh, I think it's eight uh, player props and you get to pick, you know, obviously the over under, um, and then you get points and those points, you you have to rank in the top, whatever to uh, be in the prize pool. I'm just saying, I've really enjoyed it so far. So would definitely recommend it to all of our listeners. Yes, absolutely. And we had talked about this last week, um, as well and gearing up for the masters and in watching some playoff football this past weekend, I already saw my first ad for, uh, the masters, which is very calming and soothing and gets me uh, excited for golf. <laughs> um, okay we'll move on to we'll move on to jeremy grant uh the guy that we once again torched on this podcast didn't like the contract because we didn't know what he was able to do as a number one option and as it turns out uh he's pretty good right aaron I mean, he seems pretty good like i said from the beginning uh, i would be very happy to be wrong about jeremy grant and i have been very wrong i completely blasted this signing in the off season. And I was very much wrong, very much wrong. Jeremy Grant has been nothing short of an all-star this year. You look at his averages per game over 25 points, over six rebounds, two assists over a block per game. He's been the number one option for Detroit and he has shined. He's looked very, very good. Uh, he's attacking the rim. He's isolating. He's hitting pull-up shots. He's spotting up from three. He is, doing it all offensively for a team that desperately needs at least one player that can score the basketball consistently. And Grant has been that, uh, you know, he has been a rock for this Detroit team that let's face it, just isn't very good. Uh, there there's really, you can't complain about the way that he has played. Uh, he scored 20 or more, more points in every game outside of the first game of the year, the loss to Minnesota outside of that, the, his lowest scoring output is 22 points. Um, so that just shows you how effective he's been. He's been efficient shooting the ball. Uh, he has been an all around great player for the Detroit Pistons this year and gives them either a guy that they can maybe try to build with and build around, or they give him a very valuable asset when it comes closer to the trade deadline, whether it be this year or next year, uh, Jeremy Grant has proven that he is more than just a role player. He is more than just a three and D guy. He is an all around complete player. And so far has been an all-star this season. If he keeps this level of play up, there is not a doubt in my mind that he should be named to the all-star team. The way he is playing uh, the consistency the growth that he has shown this is he encompasses what an all-star is uh, he has done it all 
for the Pistons quite literally uh, and has deserved all the praise he has gotten this year. Uh, it's not often that you see a guy get national attention, uh, but Jeremy Grant is starting to garner that for the Detroit Pistons. Uh, and you don't see that happen very much in Detroit. So it's well-earned. Uh, it's, it's, it's good to see because this was not my expectation when they signed Jeremy Grant. I thought he was just a role player, and I yeah. am very, very wrong. Yes, he is having a career season, 25.1 points, 6.2 rebounds, just under two assists, and a little over a block per game. I mean, he's clearly the number one option on this team right now. And, and you know what? He bet on himself. He came to Detroit because he wanted to prove to the rest of the NBA and, you know, maybe to himself as well, that he can be the number one option. He can go out and score, you know, 20 plus points a night. He can be a starter. Um, he was an excellent role player for the Nuggets. And it's very clear that they could probably still use him as they're sort of in a weird floundery state. He is playing so well. Um, but but he bet on himself, and you love to see that. Um, there was a, a, an excellent article from The Athletic uh, about Grant and, and coming to Detroit and playing for Troy Weaver. It's an excellent piece from James Edwards. I highly recommend everybody to give it a read. Is this level of play sustainable for Jeremy Grant? And, and you know, we sort of, we sort of hit on it a little bit, but – He's never had this amount of uh, emphasis in an offense. He's never had this role before. Um, you already said he could be an all-star, but is this really going to be um, sustainable for him? Personally, I, I don't think so. At, at 25, 6, and 2, and just over a block, seems a little bit high. I know it's 10 games. 10 games is, you know, one-seventh, basically, of the season. It's a, it's a pretty decent sample size. Um, it just seems like it's a little bit too good to be true, but maybe it's not too far off of where we're at. Yeah, I think it's going to have to die down a little bit. Um, I don't, I don't know if he can continue to average twenty five consistently every game, but I do think he can still get you around twenty points a night. Um, it, when you look at this Piston team and you look at the offensive options they have and seemingly by every game it only gets worse for them because someone else is struggling or someone else is out with an injury there's no one else that's going to be able to shoot the basketball uh that's going to consistently be get run given sets run for them uh so i i don't know if he'll average 25 throughout the whole season but i think he can stay right around it um with the way that he has played it's funny because I went from in the off season talking about him as being a role player and expecting something like this from him to that. I think to not expect it. And he's just completely blown uh, all my expectations out of the water. So I don't think it's fair for me to go out and say that this is him just having a hot streak. I don't know if he can stay above 25 points per game, but again, I think he can stay close. Um, I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt right now and look at, the rest of the Pistons roster uh, and see all the struggles within it. And I think he's just, he's the guy right now. And it looks like it's going to be that way all season. Right. I mean, somebody has to shoot. <laughs> somebody has to shoot. And Derek Rose dealing with a knee injury. You said Blake Griffin is a shell of his former self. Maybe Blake can kick it into gear and, and provide a little bit of help, but yeah, somebody has to shoot the basketball and Grant's been getting a ton of, of usage but someone who hasn't been getting very much time on the court someone who hasn't been used a whole lot is Seku Dumboya and this is where we start to get into the contentious part of Pistons Twitter and there is a lot of it believe it or not there is a lot of it he is averaging just 11.4 minutes per game Grant and Griffin are going to continue to play Sadiq Bey has certainly proved himself um, to get plenty of court time also by necessity on top of playing very well to start the year. Seku is your, was, was your, was your first round pick last year. He was, you know, the, the future 
and him and Killian Hayes are supposed to be the French connection, which is a great nickname, excellent nickname. 11 minutes per game for a guy who you banked your franchise on with a first round pick last year that you want to build around that everybody said went pretty late. You know, he thought that a lot of people thought that he was better than where he was drafted as, as just this lanky Pascal Siakam type player. Although you hope he doesn't turn into current Pascal Siakam because that's not a very good player. Are we comfortable with how Dwayne Casey is handling Dumboy and, 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 and the minutes that he's um, allocated for, for the forward positions? Absolutely not. Um, it's been nothing short of gross misconduct in terms of developing your cornerstones as of now. Whether the Pistons like it or not, Seiko Numboya is one of their young cornerstones uh, currently to this day. He is important to this team's future while he is still on it. He is just 20 years old. He is a young 20 years old. And the fact that I'm not saying Dumboya has to go out and play 30 minutes a night, but last year he got 20 minutes per game. This year he's at 11. He's essentially been cut in half in terms of his minutes on the court. There's no reason for that. His minutes only should have gone up. I get that you have Blake Griffin. I get that you have Jeremy Grant. They're going to start at the two forward spots. But why is it that Seku can only get four minutes each half that Blake Griffin isn't playing? Why is he pigeonholed only as a four? Why is he not getting more minutes on the court at the three spot and sliding Jeremy Grant to the four or just playing them together or playing Sadiq Bey and Sekou Dumboya together? He's been relegated to this, like relegated to this role in the rotation that is just, it's, it's worthless and it doesn't allow him time to, get on the court and prove himself. And that's been the talk by, by people is Seiko needs to go out there and earn his minutes. He needs to prove himself. And he's really not been given that opportunity, this opportunity this year on Sunday, he played four minutes against Phoenix. He played five minutes. He's played a combined 10 minutes in his last two games, a combined 10 minutes. When he got over 15 minutes per game, which, by the way, has only happened once this year, he scored 13 points, had two steals, two rebounds, and an assist. That was his best output of the season. When he is given minutes, he shows what he's capable of. And I'm not saying that he's been a rock star every single time he stepped out on that court because he hasn't and he's had some games where he's looked disinterested and he's made some defensive lapses and he's chucking up a few bad shots. But at the same time, he's 20 years old and isn't really being given the opportunity to develop. Don't tell me that Blake Griffin needs to be playing as much as he is. Don't tell me that you can't find minutes for Dumboya between the three and four spot. It's just, you can you're able to. Blake Griffin has no business playing 32 minutes a game for the worst team in the league. Jeremy Grant, as good as he is, doesn't need to be playing 37 minutes per game. You still want to give Grant 33, 34 minutes? Fine. But take three of those minutes and take five of Griffin's minutes and get Zimboya back up to 19 minutes per game. Don't tell me you can't find eight to 10 more minutes to get him out on that court because giving him four minutes a half or giving him a combined 10 minutes in two games is gross misconduct of player development. Something that was preached that would be a key part of the Pistons this season by the head coach himself in Dwayne Casey. Uh, There's no defending it. There's, there's just, there's no reason. You can find minutes for Sadiq Bey. You can find minutes for Sekou Namboya. And you can still play Blake Griffin and Jeremy Grant big minutes. You can still play Blake Griffin 28 minutes. You can still play Jeremy Grant 32, 33 minutes. And then you can get one of your building blocks for the future on the court more and see if there's a player there. Because you can't go a whole nother season of Sekou showing a few flashes here and there because he's only getting in spot minutes on the court. You have to throw him into the fire a bit. And even when Blake Griffin isn't playing, it just hasn't been the case. 
outside of the one game against Milwaukee where he got 23 minutes. Outside of that, he's only had one other game where he's played more than 13 minutes. All his other games are 10 minutes, eight minutes, and then five minutes in his last two games. It's not good for player development. It's not good for Sekou Demboya and his development. He needs to be on the court more. I'm not saying it needs to be 30 minutes a night. I'm not saying he needs to be a feature every single time down the court on offense. And I'm not saying he's been perfect, but he has shown some nice things on both sides of the court. Remember in that Milwaukee game as well, when he scored the 13 points, he made some nice defensive plays against Giannis Antetokounmpo in a game where no one could stop Giannis. Sekou was the only one that offered a little bit of deterrence. Uh, So he needs to be on the court more. And that's on Dwayne Casey. It's on the coaching staff. uh, And it's on this franchise to make sure that that happens. And we talked about this. We talked about this in the season preview podcast. What are the rotations going to look like? Is Casey going to defer to the vet? That's, and you know he really has no choice. You can't you can't uh, sit Blake Griffin. You can't relegate him to a lesser role for player development. He's making too much money. He's too big of a name. The logistics of that just they just don't work. He's behind Jeremy Grant, who's playing out of his mind. Um, so you you can't relegate Grant's minutes either because right now he's your bucket getter. He's the one that's providing offense. Is it just a matter of you know bad bad? choice of signing Jeremy Grant is it just unfortunate that you know he's stuck on on a particular rung of this pole waiting waiting for something to change is is it is it a lack of a coherent uh, rotation with Dwayne Casey is just not distributing the minutes because really to me there's there's like two things that make sense as to why he's not getting minutes a he's practicing really poorly. He's not earning it in, in those spots that, that we don't see, um, which I guess is possible. I, I don't, I don't really know what kind of a teammate and, and, you know, player he is in, in that sense, or the Pistons are really, really pumping the Blake Griffin train up to try to get him traded, try to find a team that's like, Oh, okay. Maybe he is okay. We'll take a you know, we'll take a chance on him and try to trade him. Those are the two, the only two reasons that I can think of as, as to why he's not getting minutes. You can't prove yourself in, in four minutes of, of play. Sorry. And, and even if you do play well in those four minutes, you're probably playing against scrubs, you know, and you're probably down 30 and it's garbage time. And what do you really gain from playing in garbage time other than padding your stats? Do you think that it's possible that the, either of those two things are, are, are at play. The, the practicing, he's just not practicing well, or, or they're trying to window dress Blake Griffin so some team looks. I think that either, if they're trying to window dress Blake Griffin, it's not going very well because he's not looking very good. And that's a problem. He's only averaging 14 points per game. He's only shooting 38% from the floor, and he's shooting under 30% from the three-point line. He is a a revolving door on defense, and he's not helping this team very much. It's harsh, but it's the unfortunate reality right now. Uh, So playing Blake Griffin 32 minutes a night is not upping his trade value. I don't know about the practicing. We haven't heard about the practicing Uh, due to the COVID restrictions. Media is not really allowed into the practice sessions. Uh, So there's no insight into that from that standpoint. Um, And if that's truly the case, you still can find a way to get him more minutes than what he's playing. And if you give him a couple weeks and he's going out there and he's putting up zeros across the stat board and he's getting lit up, defensively then fine that's a different story but right now you're the worst team in the nba you are rebuilding and you're not playing one of your most important building blocks as the roster currently stands it's a problem and again it has to be addressed because it's important for the franchise moving forward to figure out 
who and what Sekou Demboya is. Aaron, who drafted Sekou Demboya? Well, it's not Troy Weaver, but Aha. it is a guy that is still with the franchise. Right. Uh, it's, I mean, you're right. Um, but it's not Troy Weaver. And this is this is just going to come up because it has to, because he's a young guy who isn't getting minutes. Is it possible that the Pistons trade Sekou Dumboya? If, if Ed Stefanski was given the power that he was to, to mold hit the Pistons for the time that he did, just for him to stick with the franchise and someone else to come in, and blow it all up, then the Pistons needed to hire a GM back when they didn't and let Ed Stefanski come in and run the team. Because to undo every move that he has made, which so far Troy Weaver has essentially done just about all of it, it it, it, it doesn't bode well for your franchise. It doesn't say much about your, uh, you know, your willingness to be continuous and, and to work to build over time. I'm not trying to bash Troy Weaver because I think he's done a good job with uh, some of the things that he has done. And I, I think, you know, a guy, a dr- working to get a guy like Sadiq Bay through the trade trading on the draft night was well, a well-made move, but this is something that unfortunately I, I don't think Troy Weaver should be looking to do right now. I, I, I don't think trading say Kudamboya is all that great of an idea when you really don't have a reason to, and to kind of piggyback off of something, you talked about window dressing Blake Griffin, that if they were going to trade Dumboya, you would like to window dress him, and the Pistons haven't done that really in the slightest. So I don't think it's likely. I don't think it would be a good decision unless you're getting something of real magnitude back in return. But also, we, we've seen it with Troy Weaver. He, he has the... Uh, green light and he has that mentality to where he will make moves that he wants to make and if Seku does not fit into his future outlook for this Pistons team he could certainly be dealt and that's mind-boggling to think of that that we're at that point uh you know potentially of does he not fit with this team how on earth can you even discern, like decide he's not a part of this team he is 20 he was born in 2000, which is grotesque. That is so young. And now we're going to determine he doesn't fit with the team. I, I, I agree. They would probably be trying to window dress him, but it seems like his best window dressing ornament, I don't know how else to word that, is that he's a freak. He's 6'8". He's lanky as all get out. And he showed some decent flashes last year. That, that might be all the window dressing that Detroit feels that he needs, you know, he could be a, a, you know, a toss in with another player that's traded, you know, to sweeten the deal. Maybe it's to take on that giant Blake Griffin contract, you know? Oh, oh yeah. Here's your giant grotesque contract for, you know, for Griffin. Oh, and you also get Dumboya who's young and lanky and looks like he could do some stuff and can play some defense and can shoot. And I really don't think that's the case. It just has to be brought up because Troy Weaver, as we saw, is just the wheeling and dealing. He's going to move out guys that he did not not pick, that he feels, you know, just do not fit on this team. So it had you brought up. I don't really think that they're going to deal him. I think it's more likely that he he works his way back in, into the rotation more, either by playing okay or by injury, which, again, Blake Griffin's super injury prone. I mean, all this could be a moot point after tomorrow – you know, he gets hurt and oh, now Dumboy is back into the rotation. I don't, I mean, I don't really think that it could take much. Um, they're not load managing Griffin. It doesn't seem like, at least I've, I've heard that they're not load managing him. So it could be a matter of time, um, but it's a little, a little bizarre to see him only get 11 minutes per game this year in a rebuilding year. You, you would think that this would be the time to let him have, a ton of minutes. So it's a little bit bizarre. Yeah, it, it is. There's really just no other way to put it. And you have to just quickly hope that things change and 
you start to see him pop up on the court more because they just can't afford to go a whole season of not playing him uh, and not allowing him to develop. Again, it would be gross mismanagement. Gross mismanagement. That, that, that is, I think, what got Isaiah Thomas fired from the New York Knicks was gross mismanagement. If I, if I had to pick a situation to a phrase, that, that, that seems like the most accurate one. We will see what the Pistons do moving forward. They are 2-8. and eight. They are battling some injuries. They have the glorious Jeremy Grant to lead the way, to provide a little bit of hope. I don't even want to talk about Mason Plumley. I'm having an okay day. I don't, I, don't, I don't want to talk about all that stuff. I would like to see Killian Hayes on the court. I, I don't think that we're going to. And I'd like to see Dumboya on the court, and I'd like to see these young guys continue to play. And I'd, see, and I'd like to see them continue playing together so that you actually you know, can have a glimpse of what you're going to get. But we will see what the Pistons do. Aaron, do you have any closing thoughts on our slightly disappointing and, and upsetting topics here? Well, you know, it's, it's just – it's a long season, and I, I don't want to sound all – doom and gloom uh, in regards to the Pistons. You got to give them time and, you, you know, you got to let them uh, make the decisions that they feel are best. Maybe they're trying to take it slow with Duboya for reasons that we aren't privy to. Um, but there needs to be some changes and it, it's got to happen sooner rather than later because you do not want to waste a season running a lineup of, DeLon Wright, Wayne Ellington, Jeremy Grant, Blake Griffin, and Mason Plumlee uh, just to go seven and 60, you know, 65, whatever it is. Um, so that's, that's just kind of where I'm at with the Pistons right now. It's a one way ticket to Kate Cunningham though. It's not, not the worst thing in the world, or at least a until the Pistons 33% chance of getting Kate Cunningham. <laughs> Until you cut out there a little bit, Aaron. I said until the Pistons end up with the eighth pick in the draft, even though they had the worst record. <laughs> yeah, the lottery odds would not be kind. And and you know that kind of this that that's what the point of that you know altered percentages is to make sure that tanking doesn't happen. But um, Aaron, it, it it is a pleasure as always, even in this messy January of injuries and COVID all over the place. The Mavs have COVID, the Celtics have COVID. There's just COVID everywhere. Yet we still find a little bit of time to talk about our beloved Detroit Pistons doing all that they can to make us question every decision that they've made in the past three months. It's just, it's just the best. Um, So we will get through January. We will uh, watch the Pistons with um, intent to see Dumboya on the court. Um, Hopefully he gets on the court and starts to play. Hopefully Blake Griffin's good enough to trade for anything. And, you know, hopefully we start to see some growth. This is still a fun, young team. I think people continue to overlook that, you know, instead of talking about why Seku's not getting any time on the court, why don't we talk about Sadiq Bey being – awesome so far he's playing awesome 10 points a game I mean there is there is some happiness to be found on this team still um hopefully the next couple of months uh some some brief glimpses of um promise will be shown so that'll do it for this edition of the palace pistons podcast episode 113 holy crap 113 and we were on one that is insane to think about episode 113 um, I remember recording that in my dumpy house, uh, <laughs> like three houses ago. Um, Aaron, any, any closing thoughts, anything you want to say to the fans? Just that it's, you know, you just got to give it time. Uh, that's really, that's really the approach you're going to have to take with the Pistons, not just this season, but for the foreseeable future, this is a, a rebuilding team, a developing team, a developing franchise. So it, I feel like, this is kind of part of what I say every week when I close, but it's just going to take time with, with this team. And hopefully we start to see things head in the right direction moving forward. I think that's a good way to end it. Yes. Upward and onward. 
And that will officially do it for this episode of the Palace of Pistons podcast. For Aaron Johnson, I am Mike Angulano. Thank you very much for tuning in and go Browns.